All right, guys, welcome to the podcast. On today's show, we're talking with the founders of HiO. Thanks for joining. Either one of you can take this question. What does the company do? So we are HiO. We are an organic uh, social tonic beverage company that contains organic adaptogens, natural nootropics, and functional botanicals to give people kind of a healthier way to unwind in that post 5 p.m. moment. At its core, it's a functional seltzer, 30 calories, USA organic, and comes in four flavors strawberry guava, blackberry lemon, peach mango, and watermelon lime. Why this company? So there's three founders. What's up over here? George He's in the over back, Georgie. Yeah. And Our so why audience. why this company? Why Of all the problems you could solve, why did this one really just speak to you guys? Yeah, so when I was getting my MBA at UCLA Anderson, um, George and I were So wait, you around. went to USC undergrad and then yeah. UCLA? Yeah. Is that frowned Past upon in Los um, Angeles? I think we don't have best. to talk about no, it. No, it's, they it's both okay. have been great. Um, at my <laughs> you, core, you I'm a USC that. Trojan, but okay. UCLA Anderson really did help us out, and it's a big part of our Genesis story, so yeah. very grateful for that. But yeah, we were kicking around a, a few different beverage concepts. George and I are college best buds, been buds for a long time. His background's in sales at Red Bull, then at Sac Nation Crew. Mine's in finance at Guggenheim Partners. We pulled in Signy uh, when we're like, hey, we need a friend who can design a logo, who can design a brand, who can design cans. Mm -hmm. And she came in as our third co-founder, worked at WME Endeavor as a graphic designer. And then in April 2019, both George and I had family members hospitalized with alcohol-related issues. Mm -hmm. And we were creating a beverage concept. And out of solidarity with those family members, we decided to cut back our own drinking. And as we did, we saw kind of the profound need in our own lives and the lives of the loved ones that were dealing with those issues yeah. of like the challenges that are face, people face when, when trying to drink less and the optionality yeah. that was, the, I guess, the lack of optionality that they had. So we thought, okay. you know, how do we create a company that provides a, a similar stress relieving, mood boosting feel from healthy functional ingredients instead of alcohol so that people had a, a drink that made them feel stress free. So when and, someone wants to quit yeah. drinking, what do they normally do? In my head, it goes oh, sparkling water, but I don't know if that's right. What do people? What are options are available that are somewhat with not, not like loaded with sugar or like a Coca Cola? I mean, I think that has changed over time. Right. So like right. when we so when you guys Hi saw it, yeah. There, when we were creating Hio and we were cutting back our drinking, yeah, I'd probably have like a Lacroix in my hand, and people right. would be like, "Oh, that's so boring." I felt like I wasn't truly included. Like right. it wasn't meeting me where I was, and I was doing it for a good reason to try to just sure. be there in solidarity with my family member. And then nowadays, there is a lot more optionality. I think products like Hio and the, the category at large is helping people feel like they're celebrated and have you know inclusive, um, strong options that they can choose. And mm -hmm. I mean, to directly answer your question, I don't think it's like a black and white question. Like I don't think people stop drinking overnight and yeah. feel comfortable with it. We always say like our true goal over simplification is like we're trying to help people drink less, whatever that means to you. And that usually starts off with like just take a night off and then mm -hmm. it takes one, then two, and then it kind of builds from there. And I think as soon as you remove the craving or the edge for, for alcohol, like Hio or products like Hio can become a, a larger piece of your life. What year did you guys start the company? 2021. 2021. Okay. Mm -hmm. So launched. do you have any statistics on where drinking is going today? Like a lot of the youth are drinking less, mm -hmm. specifically around like 20 year old kids out of college that seem to be drinking significantly less. Yeah. I think the last that I saw was like 20% of alcohol or 20, like alcohol sales are down 20%. I don't know if that's because there was a spike during COVID and maybe it's coming down. I don't know. But do you guys have any data as it relates to sort of the new consumer drinking significantly less, or like you said, taking a couple of days off? Something I'm recalling from one of our many info decks, um, I think it's like 30% of Americans, there are 30% of Americans who don't drink at all. Oh, wow. So that's like a large chunk just right there who don't yeah. even touch alcohol. And then I wanna say something like 60% are actually trying to cut back. So doing something, whether it's taking a night off or swapping in alternative options when they are going out or switching on and off. Yeah. And 60% of people are of US 21 years and older are looking just for an alternative. And then I think the other stat I know is that 90% of those who were participating in something like Dry January, which is like an entire month off, 90% yeah. like the core reason they were doing it was just to be healthier. When it comes to the branding, so you, you have here, it says non-alcoholic social tonic. You guys could have just made a beverage. You didn't. <laughs> you decided to go non-alcoholic. Tell me about landing on this non-alcoholic social tonic name in, in the context of yeah. like, like what's, what's the, what I was mean, the vision for it of all the things you could have done with the beverage? Yeah. I mean, I think, again, it kind of goes back to what I was saying in that we want people to feel proud and that there's an option that like meets them where they are. And the term that this category mostly gets is mocktail. And we think... 
the term mocktail is a, an inferior word to cocktail. Mm -hmm. It's like a lesser than option than its alcoholic counterpart. Yeah. And so social tonic for us, like the word social means it's supposed to be enjoyed with friends and out and about. Tonic meaning it has health benefits beyond your traditional like low calorie, low sugar, like there are functional benefits to it. Mm -hmm. And creating a new category around the social tonic name made a lot of sense because it was something that you could aspire to. It's, it's a positive word, it's a positive connotation. And um, I think, yeah, social tonic just let it lend itself to more of our brand and we didn't want to label it as a mocktail. Mm -hmm. And what was the first step? What was your first product that you guys came to market with? So again, the, the moment, the, the, gen, the aha moment came in April 2019. Uh, we launched the brand in May 2021, so we really did bake out the idea in my MBA process for quite a while. Okay. Along those lines, we were formulating, we kind of went to a, a third party medicinal herbalist to try to create the botanical blend that made sense for that float feeling that we, it kind of elicits mm -hmm. with the adaptogens in your tropics. Then we took it to a third party beverage developer, said it needs to be organic, 30 calories, tastes amazing, and gave them like the boundaries. And we just iterated back and forth there, but we did launch with our three original SKUs, peach mango, watermelon lime, and blackberry lemon knowing that we wanted to create a singular functionality where each flavor does feel the same, like it has the same functional ingredients because we wanted the hardest decision you had to make as a consumer to be like, what flavor profile do you want? Right, and quickly you found out which one was the best, which one did people respond to the uh, most? Our best, so our best seller right now, or I guess historically, it's been Blackberry Lemon. That one really quickly, just early on. Um, we saw it do really well online when we first launched, and we think it's because a lot of people who are searching in the non-elk space are looking for an alternative to like their weak nut wine. Specifically, you know, a lot of women or men who are either career people or who have kids, they're coming home and they want something in like the post 5 p.m. occasion. For a lot of them, it's either beer or wine. So something that's kind of a mix of the functional and the seltzer, but at the same time, kind of the nice deep berry flavor. And then also Evan didn't mention, I will say, we have a fourth flavor we launched, which is sitting right in between us. So I couldn't forget it, but- um, the strawberry this, guava? Yes, yeah. so yeah. that was our, our first new flavor launch, um, which we sell celebrated this January for dry January. Okay. So when it comes to your customer, who is it? Because there's who I think it is, and yeah. then there's who you know it is. Who is, I, who I is your... I would love to get I, your answer first. Yeah, if I could. think... Okay, so based on... This is just uh, my information, small lens, when I go to parties. Mm -hmm. If I'm there and there's like younger folk there, they're usually not drinking. And so to me, this immediately says that the people in their 20s, let's call it, early 20s specifically, that'll probably continue to be a customer for you guys for a while. But then you said parents... Mm -hmm. And so that made me think differently about this. So who is your customer? So you're honestly close. Our actual audience profile, it's, it kind of spans, but if we were to put a persona on them, in terms of our actual customers and then our audience in general, our customers we call the cool moms. They're like 25 to 45 year old women who either have children or busy careers. Uh -huh. Kind of like I just said, they're looking for something to Some unwind. Productivity. Weeknight, weekends, even at work. Right. That also just something to have in the occasion where they might usually feel stressed out or want to reach for something. But then larger than that, I think our entire audience and who we're really going after, we call them the health seeking hedonists in which they're just people who are interested in new food and beverage. They're sober curious. They want to explore, you know, an alternative or a scene without drinking. Um, and then at the same time, they're like, self-care, you know, wellness interested people who, you know, want to take care of their health at the same time as balancing a social life and having rewarding, fulfilling experiences with their friends and fam. When you guys were first coming out, you guys raised capital at the beginning? Yeah. And so what was the, what were the conversations these investors were, or what were the questions you're getting as it relates to the category? You're sort of doing a two in one, right? So I'm unpacking this in real time as you guys yeah, are telling yeah, me yeah, the yeah. story. You're doing non-alcoholic, interesting, and then you're doing like a better for you type mm -hmm. beverage. And so to me, yeah. it's like, oh man, it's, it can sound like a lot to bite off when you're going for two, because <laughs> then people generally, the consumer isn't that intelligent. They want to put you into one category. You're sort yeah. of taking mm -hmm. two, but then in some way they're both developing. So maybe that's the right approach. What questions were you guys getting from these? Yeah, like your what you're outlining investors? is actually like the biggest, it's the opportunity that we have in front That's of us right, while yeah. also being the biggest challenge because you, we do fit in multiple categories. But I guess to take a step backwards, with Hio, we won the biggest venture competition at UCLA Anderson in my second year. So we took that $40,000. Oh, UCLA is really helping <laughs> out a lot more you're than USC. Right? Yeah, I mean, Jeez. UCLA did give us money, USC hasn't. <laughs> I gave you, USC a lot of money myself. <laughs> 
Um, but the USC but gave you your co-founders. That, that's true. You know, true. I'm not complaining yeah. at all. You have the, the chicken board. and the egg. Yeah, yeah, I'm good across the board. Yeah, but we took that, that $40,000 grant from that venture competition, spun into our first production run, and raised our first round prior to launching. So the best story I think I can say from our first fundraise was we went out with a product that we thought would be best. And as George and I started fundraising for it, we were getting some yeses and the yeses were coming because they loved the category. They loved the three of us as co-founders. They loved the opportunity, but everyone felt like kind of lukewarm about the liquid itself. And so we looked at ourselves. Like just both, the taste of it? Yeah, they're mm -hmm. just like, it's okay, but like it beverage is the most competitive category on the planet. So like your product right. needs to it's sell for good. itself. Yeah, it has to taste good. Yeah. So we had like, I think we've always had a really good three foot view to our brand and a 30,000 foot view. So what we did is we took a step back and we thought, we're not always gonna be the ones here to sell it. Like it needs to sell itself. Mm -hmm. And so we went back and reformulated to what it is today. And as soon as we did that, some of the folks that said no in the beginning immediately said yes, because they're like, you guys take feedback really well. Yeah. We loved everything but the liquid. Now we love the liquid. Right. And so like our biggest check from that round came from one of the judges of that venture competition that mm -hmm. said, I was gonna put a check in, but I didn't because I didn't love the liquid. Now I loved it and he became our single, or him and his group became the single largest investors in high. Okay, so it seemed like on the category, they were pretty much, they, they understood it. Yeah, I think, I think at the time, again, this is May or summer of 2021, we're coming off, we're in the middle of COVID or on the back end of COVID where people mm -hmm. are leaning into drinking a lot more because they're bored. And yeah. so there's this massive societal tailwind around drinking less. And I think the timing of when we came into the category was an appropriate time. And we just came in, I think, in a really solid white space with where we live with accessible flavor profiles, uh, accessible functionality, the only USD organic brand in the entire category, didn't want the price point to break the bank, and we wanted the branding to be very warm and approachable, and I think that resonated with people and continues to, to this what day. What is the price point when you guys launched? What was it then? Was it always uh, a four-pack yeah, also? It's the same. It's three okay. ninety-nine a can in store, okay. fourteen ninety-nine per four-pack in store, and on our website it's three seventy-five a can or like three thirty if you subscribe. Okay. And then when you went to market, what was your go-to-market? You know, what was the strategy there? We launched primarily direct consumer, as mm -hmm. well as did a little bit of retail in our backyard. The classic Air One story of uh, <laughs> trying to get the brand, fit the brand into Air One, and, and build a really strong case study with that. After I think the first month, the check we got back from our distributor with Air One being our sole account was less than a day's worth of our D2C sales. Mm -hmm. So we looked at ourselves and we're like, oh, we have like limited capital, limited bandwidth, mm -hmm. limited team. Right. We should just focus on our channel strategy on one core strategy that works really well. I think retail hadn't bought into this category yet. There was a lot of pent up consumer demand for products like Hio. Totally. People were all going online because that's the only place we all were. We saw, therefore we saw a really strong customer acquisition in ROAS. So we just kind of yeah. poured fuel on the fire and paid yeah. media and scaled the business really dramatically. So are you currently still doing any retail or no? Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. So okay. it's grown a lot. <laughs> yeah, like it was a, it was a, there was a natural progression. So we decided to launch our, our wholesale channel in about October of 2022. So almost a full year after launch of just primarily being direct consumer. Yeah. That we really felt like, okay, we have one stool, like one leg on this stool. Let's put a second one in case, you know, Facebook, iOS comes out, something out of our control right. comes out and knocks out our entire business. And then that ended up leading to like what we consider to be our cheat code today, which is we have this massive online community because the business still is primarily D2C okay. that we drive to shelf. So we do like a ton of stuff around driving our online community to shelf. Yeah. And I think when you, when you How stack do you do that? Up, what do you mean by that? What's the um, what yeah. specifics can you give us? It's okay. a lot of just like crossover marketing between channels. So that's kind of what something I've tackled as we've become a brand that went from, you know, online to on shelves. And it's a lot about like educating your consumer online where they can find you and how they can find you and creating more than just, I would say like an on shelf experience, but showing up in more places in addition to just the stores and the retail storefronts you're in, but also, you know, participating in events, you know, with those smaller mom and pop shops, supporting them doing, you know, I think we've done a lot of like street fairs and a couple activations where we're not only showing up in stores, but then also communities outside of that. And I think what I try to do is keep a very steady stream of communications across social media, across advertising, across email, SMS, you know, in-store event, and make sure that they all align and that everyone who are who's on those platforms and the audience specific to those is kind of getting those curated messages about the easiest way to find us, the best way to find us. Sure, and new launches. Yeah. yeah, and so you guys are raising your Series A, it's up, right. right? And so yes. how many stars are you guys in now? I'd say we're in about 2,500, and okay. we should, mm -hmm. as of the middle this year, be in an additional 1,500, so around 4,000-ish. 
and then like 10,000 next year. Uh, yeah. That's sort of yeah. the goal. Not yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's I mean, actually, that's I mean, the trajectory. That's the trajectory. Like yeah. last year, it was an 80 20 split D to C to wholesale. This year, should oh, be. Oh, wow. Yeah. So you're going to, yeah. You'll this year, should be about 60 40. Yeah, sure. Um, and then it should flip and continue to flip. What uh, does that give people a window into that? So the, for, for the entrepreneur listening around, potentially wanting to start a CPG brand. What has that flip been like? Because it's a lot more logistics. It's a lot more uh, people to deal with. No, no. Like, I think, and if it, this is a piece of advice, and it's not going to work for everyone, right? I can only speak for what worked for our brand. Starting D2C and really building that online presence, building that consumer feedback loop, gaining that loyal customer base around the country, then layering that into retail felt to us like the natural progression that we should go with, as opposed to traditional CPG is like, door by door, start retail right. first, hope right. people pull down your brand off the shelf, learn mm -hmm. more, try it, love it, and come back and buy again. Very few and that, touches, that's no a, email. That's a little bit right. of a slog, right? I think totally. that the modern day way of building a brand, paid media is amazing. It not only is it brand awareness, but it could convert. And it's not like our DTC, yeah, again, our DTC business is still extremely strong. Like there are a lot of folks that like to find us only there and subscription just creates mm -hmm. the best, easiest user experience. But I think the name of the game in beverage is, is, in, is in wholesale, right? You got to meet people in store where they mm -hmm. traditionally buy beverages, and that's the best way to scale. So I think we scaled D to C, and we continue to scale D to C, but every time we add in a new channel, it feels like an organic, natural progression of the, of the business itself. Have you guys had any interesting conversations with like big players in the space that are looking, maybe even alcohol companies, mm -hmm. where yeah. they're looking at you guys and they're like, okay, here's what we're seeing in the market. Any interesting conversations around like maybe something you didn't, I'll give you an example. I had a company once and we were in the process of selling it. During the due diligence, they asked mm -hmm. us, how many orders do you fulfill over the phone? And we were like, we don't even have a phone number. <laughs> yeah. Zero yeah. is that People answer. call my phone number when, when they have a <laughs> question about an order, it's my they call you. It's, yeah, it's actually horrible. But they don't order through um, you, they'll just go through the website. Yeah, yeah, right. exactly. And so that was like zero. And they yeah. were like, really? Oh, we do 20% over the phone. And that's when I knew our company just skyrocketed in value. I had no idea mm -hmm. other, how other people were doing their businesses. Right, we were an all online platform. When you guys talk to these companies, are they gleaming some insight that you hadn't considered at the beginning? I think what's really important is like, at least as I understand it, like the more traditional non alk players, the Coke, Pepsi's, and Dr Pepper Keurig, like they're trying to get more into alcohol. And then the alcohol players, mm -hmm. especially with declining beer sales or declining alcohol, I would say uh, declining beer sales. They're trying to get into soda. They're trying to get no, not soda. <laughs> they're trying to get into non alk. Non alk. So like, okay. in terms of where high, where we see Hyo going the more likely path to partner with somebody yeah. actually is with a BevAlk player than it is with Coke or Pepsi, given the way like Hyo acts, talks, looks, feels, See, like all so of that. that's so interesting to me because mm -hmm. I think about it like it's totally a different consumer. Or maybe it's not. Maybe the point of that Well, they're more used to the occasion. Not. Like the way we're going to end up distributing down the road is more similar to alcohol. The way like the occasion is similar, like the look, feel, like it's just more similar. Whereas like the, good... the Olipops and Poppies of the world make sense for the Coke, yeah. Pepsi. That's right. KDPs because like that's more akin to what they do. Analogy for the elk space and something I just I find ironic in like this year especially because it launched I think this year late last. But like when we started HIO and we were talking about being in the non-alcoholic space, we were trying to think, you know, there are different categories. There's the functional, but then there's also the mimic that he's talked about, like NA beer, NA wine, mm -hmm. NA spirits. And we kind of said, you know, at that point when we were talking about this, White Claw was the rage. Every alcohol company mm -hmm. was launching a seltzer format. Truly was coming out, That's you know, right. Topo Chico, everyone was doing something seltzer. Yeah. And so we're like, we're going to be, you know, the non-alcoholic White Claw. Like we want to have that level of recognition. And then this year, White Claw has come back around. They have a 0.0, .0 <laughs> format now. They completely launched a fully non-alcoholic White Claw. It is literally a seltzer water. That tastes like White Claw, but it has no alcohol. Let's say you guys were VCs, <laughs> okay? <laughs> and we're going to say it's 2028. What, what are the companies being acquired over most other companies? Is it, is it just a sparkling water? Is it what you guys are working on? Or is it the poppies? Which are you talking about? Our sp oh, all spaces. Oh, yeah. Like yeah, just sort of think about it from where is the most activity happening? In I in, mean, the crown jewels of all now. beverage at the moment probably are the Olipop and poppies of the world. I think Absolutely. prebiotic yeah. sodas are definitely having a moment, mm -hmm. and I think obviously we're in t super close to this emerging category. Yeah, you're category, right there. But we're doing a very similar thing. It. If I come back to like what I said earlier, where you're like, where I said it's the, both the challenge and the opportunity because we are at its core a functional beverage, yeah. but mm -hmm. because of our marketing and positioning. 
we live in the alcohol occasion. So that creates this really interesting dichotomy in stores where like, should we go in the functional wall or should we go in the alcohol aisle? And that again, creates a massive opportunity and challenge. But when George is selling into retail stores and our sales team, like we're selling the category because it doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to help people create that shelf space, knowing that this category is here to stay. So like, I think the emergence of Poppy and Olipop, like they're at their mature rise and I'm sure they're gonna continue to scale, but mm -hmm. like everyone knows, like they have a dedicated spot in the store. And this category, us, along with our competitors, we're building that together and it's happening. And it, every year is getting better and better. And obviously we're the most biased people there are, but we think by 2028, <laughs> we're consumer VCs, this category will have a, a permanent space on That's the on right shelf. answer, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> That's the right answer. That's amazing. All right. When it comes to any advice you guys have been have gotten over this this journey, what's some of the best advice you've gotten? It's hard. What you guys are doing is really no. tough. I mean, I think one of the just my takeaway right now, yeah. becoming not pigeonholing yourself into the functional category mm -hmm. could yeah. be considered a stroke of genius. So I'll I'll <laughs> actually relate that to what actually happened. So the first concept we came up with was this activated charcoal coconut water functional okay. beverage concept. Fully functional. And in one of my classes, they said, why do people care? Why would people pull you off? They used the air one analogy. Why would people pull you off UCLA this massive wall? UCLA has done big things for you. I <laughs> no, mean, I know. It's and crazy. I, and I couldn't answer that question. I right. had no really, I was like, it seems like a cool concept. Activated charcoal was hot at this time. I was like, this is, this is awesome. But like, so my piece of advice is, if you're trying to start a food and beverage brand, yeah the world needs to have needs your product like needs to have your product in order for you to launch it because right. if it's based upon a trend or it's based upon like a cash grab or something like that like it'll come and go mm -hmm. but it, the things that stay are things that actually fulfill a need in consumers lives mm -hmm. so like they're actually being a need. it can't just be like oh we want to be Hyo, but like a little bit like one degree different in flavor like that's Hyo exists or you know what I'm saying? Like yeah. it, it can't just be like one like one better taste or one better this. It has to fulfill I an exact you're... need. Yeah, and something I would say to that in, in the same vein is like, you're circling the need for a mission. And I think something that's been incredibly beneficial for our brand and has just helped us grow and been something that consumers have really attached themselves to is like the mission behind it and the story, you know, that Evan sure. just kind of went through. And I think something for me from a brand marketing perspective that I saw when we were starting out and I was looking at a lot of the big beverage was like, I hate to sound, you know, a little negative, but like the lack of personality behind some of them where they look like brands, but it doesn't look like it's run by people. It doesn't look like it's actual, you know, real. And so what I wanted to do in that and, you know, a large part of Hyo's brand marketing too is the inclusivity and, you know, just the factor of wanting to be in the occasion. And so, you know, we sought out kind of to do that in a way that it would give people something that could help them in that occasion. And they're understanding that it's coming from people who have been in their same exact shoes. I'd say also just for one clear piece of advice, like I think one of the best things we've done is focus. So especially as I relate that to channel strategy, like going mm -hmm. DC first, then wholesale second and becoming omni-channel then, that to us felt more palatable than say if we launched and we're like, okay, we're gonna go DC off-premise, on-premise food service all at the same time yeah. and do each one of those just okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like that narrative never made sense to us. And then I think the other piece of advice for people that have told us, it's like, you don't build a brand overnight. Like it really is brick by brick. And I think where a lot of founders go wrong in CPG is they try to like go as fast as possible and go as in, in as many stores as, and then they get over their skis yeah. and then they miss their one opportunity and then they're done. So I think it, it is a long haul yeah. and it's, it's a, a, you know. But being over your skis is how you win in general. <laughs> I'm sure you guys feel like you're in We try not to skis. get over our skis we and we use that analogy a lot, but like we try to stay, like okay. I think we've grown at the right speed. We haven't yeah. grown too slow to where like the categories pass us by. We think we're one of the biggest players in our specific space, but we mm -hmm. haven't grown too fast where we ran out of, like you ran out of cash, you're done, right? Or right. anything like that. So right. I think there's a happy, happy medium. As you guys are closing the A round, what, what's on deck for you guys? How do you think about this year, 2024, and then Q1? A lot of the A is just kind of right-sizing the business. So we have actually scaled the business dramatically while raising next to nothing in terms of like the ratio of Because of the D2C channel? Yeah, yeah, and the cash cycle of D2C channel and just our ability to use debt to our advantage. We kind of skipped some of the more dilutive equity rounds. So I think we're a bit of right-sizing uh, production, but it still is, again, staying very focused. We're parallel pathing a debt process to help us fund working capital needs and using the equity that we're raising in the Series A to just do growth levers. It's 
It's funding retail launches. It's scaling up D2C, particularly with our Amazon launch that's happening in a couple of weeks. It's making a couple of new hires and continuing to lean into the channels that we are already in and just mm -hmm. grow those to the size that we think are important and then layer in a next channel. So it's a bit of right sizing the business, but it should provide about two years of cash runway and we intend to be profitable by middle of next year. So it might be the last round we ever raise. Wow. Hopefully. <laughs> Hopefully. But the other piece of advice that's, is things, that's changed things take too. Twice as long, cost twi <laughs> twice as much, right? Yeah. That's what people always say. So true. maybe, like but well. yeah, it'd be it's great if you can raise around opportunistically as opposed to you have to because you have to. Mm -hmm. On the marketing side, what are you excited about when it comes to, or on the branding side, when it comes to the, having some extra cash to do oh, some gosh. fun stuff? We've just started really kind of planting our flag, I would say, in terms of marketing and on site this year. Something I'm most excited about just because we're in the thick of it right now. We became the official non-alcohol functional beverage partner for Insomniac, which is a large US-based electronic music festival concert producer. And they have very, very large kind of festivals, concerts, raves throughout the entire country that, you know, their biggest one annually draws like half a million people to Las Vegas. We launched as the exclusive non-alc for them this year at that large festival called EDC Las Vegas. So now we're actually building out a footprint of activation on site where traditionally, you know, we've done support and we've had product at events, but this is like fully us. We're making mocktail bars. We're bringing like a retrofitted Airstream, I would say, to actually show up in some of the occasions that we want to see our product in. I yeah. think that was always at the end of the day, we agreed that, you know, we wanted to focus too in terms of marketing on industries that we cared about and that, you know, we grew up in and grew up loving as a group of co-founders, music being the primary one. And so that was kind of, it's a dream come true right now to see That's a partnership yeah. like that come to life. We've been working on it for two or two more years, years yeah. now. So getting to launch that in May and then now there's a circuit of four festivals we're doing all throughout the summer um, through different parts of the country with them. And so just nice to be on site and see people's reaction in person and yeah. get to actually create these really fun, rewarding experiences for ourselves and for the people drinking. Any us. dream collabs you want to do? Maybe a pickleball or something? I don't know. I'm just, just, <laughs> um, it seems like the right market, right? So again, like I think half of what we're doing is creating a product and the other half is the mission and we're trying mm -hmm. to change a, a really ingrained societal norm around drinking. And for us, that's also like one part getting it in the right people's hands. So we thought music was the perfect avenue that needed it on both the consumer side and the artist side where you know people in entertainment are the ones who are socializing the most they're out and about a lot and, and on the consumer side if you're seeing your favorite artist or dj like why should you only drink red bull or like a soda water and lime <laughs> or only alcohol right so there's a, a great need for optionality from the consumer side and in order to change the societal norm like that and move culture you have to get it into the right people's hands so we think you know over time if we can get in the right artists dj hands that we can continue to kind of rebalance the paradigm of of yeah. drinking a little bit less again like alcohol is not going anywhere nor do we ever say it is we just <laughs> yeah. think that there's a a necessary rebalance that that should do you guys happen. drink do you guys the three of you yeah yeah i okay. think we rep, rep, like represent a good spectrum i think me specifically i'm be very sparingly like once a month probably i'm more of a social drinker so i'm someone yeah. who yeah maybe if i go out to dinner maybe like a cocktail or a glass of wine a week but it's, it's a spectrum between kind of how much you want to cut back. We've all gone sober. We've done dry yeah, months done and stints. stints sober, but I think it's really just depending on, yeah, what you feel your comfort level is. And in terms of cutting back, I think that's what Evan was getting at, where we don't ever really try to define what sober means for people because we know that it's a spectrum and that certain people react completely differently. So that's kind true. of letting people figure it out. What else do people know? Anything you guys want to tease? Anything you want to oh, entice about people to go... I'm like, Where can they buy your product locally here in LA? Here in LA, oh, absolutely. pretty much everywhere. <laughs> uh, I Whole mean, Whole Foods, Foods. Sprouts, uh, Erewhon, Lazy Acres, Bristol Farms, the Vitamin Shop. Everywhere. Yeah. Lassen's, Mothers, <laughs> yeah. Jensen's, nice. Jimbo's. SoCal, we've got covered. You SoCal's great. Yeah, yeah, we have some other good retail launches cooking. Okay. Um, 10,000 stores next year. Yeah, yeah, we're working on our uh, our fifth flavor. That's going to be a whole other line. So mm -hmm. there, nice. I think maybe that's a teaser of like that is. the core <laughs> line of the, we actually haven't even talked to anybody about this. The four flavors that the three core that we launched plus uh, strawberry, strawberry guava. guava is like mm -hmm. a set core at this point. Yeah. And then we're going kind of a different direction on the, the next four. And we, when is that one? Uh, is we intend flavor? to launch a flavor by December, okay. then summer of next year, then December again, and summer of next year to create a new four 
cohesive set. Well, thanks for coming on the pod. Tell people where they can find you and, and buy, obviously, the uh, product yeah. on Instagram, all the stuff. Yeah. Of course. We're at Drinkio on pretty much every social channel. And then drinkio.com. Ooh, why the name? Sorry. Why Hio? What does Hio mean? Oh, great question. So yeah. Hio is an acronym for happy in your own, um, which oh, is our that's take. adorable. Awesome. Yeah, thank you. Jesus. It's our take My on... heart just smiled. You said it. <laughs> happy in your own. Yeah. How um, fucking adorable is that? Yeah. So that was actually oh. the product. Uh, I've got to give a nod to our guy, George, over here. Wow. Georgie. <laughs> Georgie in the corner. The just as we sign out. The George in the um, corner. But yeah. yeah, we actually had written down a list of just inspiring like phrases and words when we were trying to come up with a name. George came up with that phrase as a take on like being comfortable in your own skin or just being happy with yourself as you are. We couldn't phrase that, you know, as the name of the beverage (laughs) and we abbreviated and realized it was HIO, which also is like social greetings, hi and yo. Then we went to the trademark page of the USPTO. Your name trademark. That's when you know you're fully done. And it was empty. And we were like, wait. And we kept saying it and it just, it kind of totally stuck. What a good yeah. team you guys have. George, are you happy with their performance today? They did great, he said. All right. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right. Thanks for coming on, guys. Thanks, thanks for, having, for us. having us. Thank you for tuning in. If you enjoyed this episode, share with your friends, your family, or anyone you might think might benefit from the conversation we've had today. And if you haven't already, please take a moment to leave a review on your favorite podcast platform. We'd greatly appreciate it. Your feedback helps us improve and reach more people who can benefit from our discussions. The best way to stay connected with us and get the latest updates on future episodes is through our social media channels. You can find us at Startup Storefront. We'll be back next Tuesday with another great episode. See you then.